Hello. No, now you went away again. Can you hear me now? Yep, now I can hear you very well. Good, excellent. Okay. What's the main thing that you're working with now? So well, actually, it's a, very, it it's a very, very good question. Oh, really? It's like everybody, does, everybody is a portfolio worker these days. But um, the, the main project, the biggest project, and there's several happening at the moment, has been one that we started 18 months ago, um, which is the Rapid Transition Alliance, which is telling the stories of you know, real transitions and the possibility of transition. Um, and that's been, um, yeah, we've been doing that for about a kind of a year and a half. We did, we, that's been a project of our own organization, the New Weather Institute. But we've been doing it jointly with um, the University of Sussex. And we've created this kind of network of 50 plus um, groups from very community based groups up to sort of international advocacy oriented NGOs. And, um, but it's the, the tagline that we've been using has been about sort of evidence-based hope, looking for current and historical demonstrations of the fact that we can make the changes we need to make at the speed and scale that the climate science tells us is necessary. And we've been building up this sort of evidence base, we're publishing sort of new stories of change. Um, every week we've been holding a series of conversations, reflecting on the current crisis trying to pick lessons out of that that we can apply to the broader challenge as we understand it. But then just really quickly, um, in addition to that, I work a day a week with a group called Scientists for Global Responsibility as their assistant director. They've got a background in a lot of the um, work on uh, sort of demilitarization and the anti-nuclear side of things, but they also work on climate and energy issues and they work on educational issues as well. Um, and we've got a couple of new campaigns which are in the process of beginning now, one around car free cities and another one to try and bring an end to the advertising of fossil fuels and fossil fuel intensive activities using the analogy of the ban on um, cigarette um, advertising. Mm. Um, so there's several things going on and lots of other little bits and pieces happening sort of around the sides as well. So busy, 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 busy times. Uh -huh. And are you, to what extent do you see more localized economies as a, a central part of this great transition, speedy transition? Well, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really good question. And sitting here in the middle of the um, coronavirus, the novel coronavirus uh, pandemic, one of the things which has um, struck me is the way in which local responses based upon local knowledge and local infrastructure and local understanding uh, are known to be the only effective way in which you can deal with a problem like that. And the other interesting thing is that under this enforced lockdown that people have been experiencing, it's thrown people back into a very intimate relationship with their local economy and their local neighborhood and their local community. And it's revealed the degree to which um, local matters. It's shown on the first instance that whenever people are dealing with a great upheaval or a great challenge, um, communities themselves are always the first and probably most important responders. We've seen this flourishing of mutual aid at the local level, very often in the face of state failures. We've also seen the way in which people have experienced their local neighbourhoods, again, with that um, brief glorious period of time when traffic reduced dramatically and um, the air cleared and the skies cleared and a lot of people turned to the neighbors children were quite literally playing out on the pavements you know writing in chalk on the streets again this kind of re-experience of the local which the pause in business as usual allowed i think revealed how important it is but it also revealed what a lot of the pre-existing imbalances and problems with the economy were. We saw in the initial economic responses how sort of the difference that, that between big businesses and small independent businesses and small independent businesses were much more vulnerable. They had less access to the levers of power and the levers of influence. We've also seen how the work which holds the fabric of community together, um, the, the, the discussion around 
key workers. Um, and the irony about the way in which key workers, who may be the people who clean our streets, who will keep food on the shelves in our shops, or who work in our hospitals and health centers, how these have been um, literally undervalued and underpaid. And many of the roles in the economy, which people and politicians have stood in awe of, like the role of the sort of city of London, we've seen this as being some of the sort of superfluous fluff on the top of the economy. We've seen, once again, the things that, that really do matter. I think one of the other interesting things has been the way in which people have rediscovered something which the transition town movement has talked about for a long time, and that is reskilling, removed from many of the normal um, activities, normal economic activities. People have been making their own entertainment, making their own food, going back to some sort of basics, which has, um, which has been locally rooted because we have literally been you know at home relearning things at home so i think there's lots of ways in which we saw the the crisis revealed the immense bias towards big heavy centralized and fossil fuel intensive economic systems the the bias towards the car in urban space and we've realized the importance of opening up more space for people and more space for nature in the places where we live but we've also seen the way in which local economies have been so terribly undermined by the broader global economic trends particularly where finance is concerned i've personally found it fascinating when it was necessary to introduce mechanisms and measures to support local businesses. But one of the ways in the United Kingdom that this was done was an attempt to channel it through our, our banks. But of course, our banks are still largely unreformed from the financial crisis of 2007, 2008. And one of the things which was even the case then was the way in which the banking system had lost its ability to back up support and underpin the real economy of the local economy, or the, the, the relationships and the knowledge needed between sort of productive banking as opposed to speculative banking had gone. And of course, that has not been replaced. So whilst there's been economic support, for example, to back up the banks to encourage them to lend to local businesses, all the risk has been put on the local business. The banks themselves have been immunized against any risk by the kind of economic measures that have been put in place. But the very economic institutions, the independent local businesses that we need to have thriving, th flourishing local economies haven't been directly helped. The, 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 the mechanisms were wrong. So I think there's an enormous number of lessons that can be learned from what's been happening over the last few months. You're so articulate as ever, and you're such a hero, you know, in our film, The Economics of Happiness, because you're really, really excellent. And can you say something about, have you seen attempts, as we do, as sort of holders of information from around the world about local economies, have you seen these initiatives at the local level where, where funders and sometimes ordinary citizens come together to fund these local businesses, to support these small businesses that the banks are incapable of doing. Do you, do you see examples of that that you're familiar with or, or, or not so much? Well, I think um, there is still a real problem in the sense that people trying to do different things, trying to do better things, trying to conduct business in a way that it weaves community together, strengthen, strengthens neighborhoods and deals with some of these outstanding, uh, our outstanding environmental problems um, are always swimming against the tide. So what I find remarkable, I suppose, is that given the, the macroeconomic levers and, and structures that surround us have been so um, uh, sort of antithetical to good things happening at the local level, what's remarkable is how many good things do still regardless happen at the local level. And I think local economies and, and, and people with goodwill abhor a vacuum and move in to replace it. And I think there's a lot of kind of cultural self and economic self-medication going on when people go out and set up their own local businesses to meet 
local needs. And I do see it, and I see it in a, in a big city like London that is so distorted by the presence of the financial markets in the city of London. You nevertheless see down at the local level, at the neighborhood level, a huge amount of people doing everything that, it, that they can, swimming against these economic tides to create food businesses, to create micro breweries, to create um, things which bring people together, bring communities together. And what's interesting is the way in which and there's, there is a sort of slightly more holistic approach being taken, I think, where, where businesses are doing more than one thing at the same time. There's a new um, a community space about to open about a mile down the road from me, which will bring together micro entrepreneurs with a community space, with a place to eat. And you, you see these things happening all the time. And I think people are kind of voting with their own feet about wanting that authenticity, wanting that sense of real connection, and wanting to know that they are engaging in buying goods and services from people who themselves are motivated to try and tackle some of these bigger problems. And I think that's the big thing which people often forget, that a business is never just a business. It has within it, depending upon the way that it operates, a kind of self-replicating DNA. If you have something which is remotely owned and is extractive in nature, that is only interested in taking money out of an activity, that's what happens and you hollow out an area. But if you've got people who are interested in reweaving the fabric of community and ensuring that you irrigate the economic benefits of doing that in the local area, then you get something which, it, it, which is an upward spiral of improvement, both in the economic conditions, but in the social fabric and in the, the conviviality of what it is like to live in a place. And I do see signs of that happening. Well, you know, I just couldn't agree with you more about the miracle of these things happening, swimming against such a heavy tide. You know, it's like it's like a, an avalanche of pressures in the opposite direction. And I so want people to take heart in this as evidence that human beings are not greedy, aggressive, and brutish and nasty by nature. You know, I think when you really understand how heavy those pressures are, and they include virtually every regulation, and this heavy subsidies, not just for fossil fuels, but at every step of the way, undermining that human potential and that more human scale, community-based way of doing things, still they're springing up all over. And, and I, I so want to change this dominant narrative, which is, you know, for many people now, just sort of accepted that we are brutish and we're so greedy, we're so stupid, you know, why haven't we changed? We've, heard all the information about climate change and then still we didn't do anything. So I hope you agree that we urgently need to get a, a different narrative out and, and expose much more what are these heavy-handed structures that keep pushing society in the opposite direction? How much do they have to do with our very governments becoming impoverished and going with a begging bowl to private banks that are essentially run by algorithms. And now, would you agree that after COVID, we're sort of at this monumentally important fork in the road where we can choose to go along with the dominant pressure, and that means into the arms of robots, satellites, and drones on our way to Mars to mine even more minerals because we just decided to trash the Earth, or do we want to follow what is also a more feminine path and where I see in the worldwide localization movement so many women at the grassroots who constitutionally are more connected to both community and the earth moving in the opposite direction. So, you know, they're diametrically opposed directions. One is archetypically male, I would say teenage boy. The other one is archetypically female and maybe a wise not quite as elderly and granny-like as I am, but still a, you know, a, a path that would bring us back home to a way of slowing down, scaling down, allowing ourselves to, to nurture and care for the earth, for our children, for ourselves. Um, well, I, I think one of the things that's interesting is that um, one of my great criticisms of um, mainstream economics as it is 
lived in the public conversation, in the public domain, in the way which is profoundly influential over political policies. For the last three or four decades, we've had a version of it, a sort of a, a folk version of a kind of economics which has at its heart this two-dimensional cipher of human nature, which is self-interested, individualistic, highly competitive, and that if anything, the experience of the last few months tells you is not rooted in reality. There's an old trope that you see in disaster movies that whenever society gets a little bit stressed, we all turn on ourselves and we loot and fall apart and go crazy. But you look around um, at how the world has responded and how people have responded to the crisis over the last few months. And almost entirely, it's been with deep humanity, deep caring, looking out for each other, respecting each other's space when asked to do so, communities coming together to care for the most vulnerable and marginalized groups. The reality of human nature is so far removed from the mainstream economic cipher as to be almost laughable. And what, what, what I find so extraordinary, considering the grip on the political imagination that mainstream neoliberal type economics has, is that it's simply not based on evidence. It's based on so many suppositions, so many assumptions that when you scratch them are quite absurd. That if we can draw from the lived experiences of how people actually are and how we do have, you know, un almost un uniquely in the animal kingdom, overwhelmingly cooperative and empathetic abilities, to look out for each other. And if you turn around and build an economics on that, you end up with something very, very different, something much more like what you were talking about. And yes, I do think, of course, there is has, and has been and continues to be an enormous gender bias in the practice of economics itself and in the running of the economy. And that if we could get rid of that bias and have far more equality between um, genders, then I do think the world would be an immensely better place. And even just looking at some of the global leadership, um, and of course it's possible to come up with exemptions in, in, in all cases, but I think where we have seen female leaders and their responses to the crisis, they have um, played seemingly a much better game than some of the male leaders that we've seen during the recent, during the recent crisis. So um, I think, what I take um, confidence from, what I take encouragement from, is that not only is the evidence on our side that we can lead good lives in a way which is far more respective of planetary boundaries and far more respectful of each other and in a way that looks out for each other more so, that that is a more effective way of organising, that we are more inclined by our natures to do that regardless. Um, but that also the evidence for the other way of doing things, um, the dominant way of doing things for the last three or four uh, decades has fallen apart. I think there's been an evacuation of self-confidence even within the model. I think it's thrashing around and you see some of, um, some of these sort of outliers and uh, exponents of that way of doing things still highly vocal. But it seems to me to be in its death throes. And I do think that there is a different mindset being brought to economics, being brought to um, questions of how we solve our economic and environmental and social problems at the same time. And I think the evidence is now all on our side. I mean, um, in terms of some of the changes we need to bring about, we've been arguing for the last decade for something like a Green New Deal. And I do think that sort of transformational program rooted in more flourishing and diverse uh, 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 dynamic local economies, um, which helps steer us towards a, a way in which we can kind of flourish within planetary boundaries uh, and meet everybody's needs at the same time. I think wherever you ask, you know, what does a policy package to deliver this better world look like? It, it looks something like a locally rooted Green New Deal. Um, and so, so I am positive. I do think that the skies have cleared in uh, both a literal and a metaphorical way over the last few months. And I think there is an opportunity to build back better and to have a just and green recovery coming out of the crisis. And I think the crisis has been terrible. It's been a tragedy for some people, but it has at the same time starkly revealed what was wrong and what we had, um, the ways in which we had been left vulnerable. But it has also shown people at their very best and has pointed the way forward.
I wonder how much of the language of Green New Deal you think is actually connected to an idea of more resilient local economies. Is there a lot of Green New Deal, um, you know, um, positioning that is perhaps the opposite, that is perhaps linked to trying to fuel the entire global economy with renewables and continue to increase energy consumption? What do you say about that? When you talk about the Green New Deal, um, obviously, uh, the, 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 great, um, the great danger is that a successful term um, brings its own problems in that people can pick it up and use it as they wish. And there, since we wrote the first call for a Green New Deal back in uh, 2008 in response to the financial crisis, we had a very clear and specific idea about what that would what that would look like now it's been picked up and it's been used and different versions of it being used by many um, people since but when I talk about a green new deal I think of an economy which uh, is designed to meet all our needs to work within planetary boundaries and to be deeply rooted in a humane scale economics which is delivering at the local level now in the United Kingdom we when we first published the Green New Deal, step one was going to be creating jobs at a local level, looking at the rehabilitation of the housing stock to deal with fuel poverty, to reduce our need for energy consumption, to create jobs which were good jobs, but sustainable jobs, which kept generated and kept wealth at the local level where people needed it and created jobs where those jobs were also most needed. Now, that can then apply in different ways to the particularities of what a, a proper green economy for a food economy and a resilient food economy looks like, what it looks like in terms of how we rethink and reimagine our communities to reduce the need for transport in the first place. And then when we need transport to make sure that it is clean, accessible, uh, green uh, mass transit and active transit that the crisis at the moment has given a, a glimpse of what that might mean in practice at the local level more space for people to walk and cycle less space for the car so when i talk about a green new deal and i think um, the colleagues that i work with with the original green new deal group would share this too as being um, enthusiastic advocates of reimagining economics from the point of view of subsidiarity that tricky old word but, but which means basically that you always do things at the most local and practicable level. That doesn't mean you do everything in your neighborhood. Um, you could have, you know, every neighborhood might have its own bakery, but not every neighborhood would have its own factory making trains, for example. But you do things at the most local, practicable level. So I think uh, my version of the Green New Deal is, and I can't speak on behalf of everybody who's going to invoke the term, and I can't completely control how other people might apply other meanings to it. But for me, um, the, the future of the Green New Deal is one which grows from the roots up, from the foundations of strong, diverse, uh, you know, independent local economies. Localization also involves the need for every business to be place-based in order to be democratically accountable. And what we're saying is that we need to be very soon negotiating new trade treaties, which are going to be democratic process determining the rules for business rather than business determining the rules for government, which is what's happening now. And we basically see a future where we will become alert to the danger of allowing businesses to blackmail governments by saying, if you don't do as we say, we're going to go elsewhere. So we want to insist that every business decides to be British or Chinese or, or French and accepts the rules determined by democratic process. Would you see that also as part of the way forward, as part of this great transition? 
Well, I think, you know, fundamentally, I mean, we've seen why we're in, why are we in, oh, there are many reasons why we're in the, 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 the mess we're in at the moment. One of the reasons that we're in the, the mess we're in at the moment is because, I mean, you saw in the 19th century, the aggressive rise of a kind of industrial form of, of capitalism that had no checks and balances. And then you had the rise of the labor movement, which saw to temper some of those worst excesses. Um, since then, you've seen the rise of the multinational um, corporation, but not yet the emergence of any kind of meaningful infrastructure that can apply checks and balances to those institutions. I think democracy comes before economic form. And I think different forms of ownership of companies and corporations are fundamental if those organizations and those companies are going to be responsive to um, human need, um, community need, and environmental need. So I think we absolutely definitely need ways in which we can reroute function that the forms of the economy, the corporate forms of the economy, so that they are not footloose and detached from local realities and that they aren't rooted. And I think there should be absolutely democratic ways of holding those companies to account. And I think that in terms of just how um, positive feedback loops occur within a local economy, if something is independent or and locally owned and in greater and more meaningful ways locally accountable, then you're much more likely to align economic and business purpose with human need and community need and environmental need. And I think the absence of that is one of the great weaknesses of the economy at the moment. It makes much more sense to decentralize business than it does to centralize governance even further, because I'm sure you're also seeing with your you know, experience that subsidiarity, even in terms of governance, wherever possible, needs to be decentralized. But I'm always warning about the danger of decentralizing politically before we decentralize economically, because without economic power, there is no real political power. Well, I mean, I, I, think, I think the point is that you need, you need the right... Um, the right checks and balances and the uh, right ways of being able to um, manage things at whichever level. So, for example, in the United Kingdom, I think the principle, just to say again, for, to be absolutely clear, is subsidiarity, that things should happen always at the most local, um, uh, practicable and, and effective level. If, for example, in the United Kingdom, we had um, a process of localization, however, that happened without the ability to redistribute, which might require at some point higher levels of um, ability to organize and arrange things. You might end up with, for example, the you know, already overheated south of England and particularly wealthy neighborhoods and boroughs within London, very effectively capturing and keeping wealth within their areas. So I think you're always going to need some mechanism which can deal with problems which happen at a larger level and which happen across borders or happen across regions. So there needs to be some way of coordinating global efforts to deal with the grotesque inequalities which exist globally and you need some level of global organization which can deal with transboundary issues like climate change for example but that should be built upon the fact that we are doing whatever we can at the most local effective level where you can have the most meaningful human um, connections and relationships and where you can where you can be most closely um, aware of and um, in tune with what the issue is on the ground. And also, I think, you know, when we look at the global uh, structures, we're actually talking about collaboration to protect people and the environment. And that's the opposite of global economic activity and power. So, you know, this, uh, the whole idea is that business should essentially be place-based. And that to me means that, you know, from now on, you're not gonna be allowed to be multinational. When I say from now on, I think it's very reasonable to envision the potential for a process whereby the multinational companies are given a certain amount of time to start making arrangements to choose which musical chair they're going to pick, but they're no longer gonna governments pushed by their 
awakened citizenry will insist on them taking place, you know, becoming place-based. And of course, that doesn't eliminate the opportunity for them to collaborate in the future, or particularly for nations to collaborate, even in economic projects. But it's this structural ability for them, you know, to have through free trade treaties, have been liberated to move around and to have been liberated to sue governments if they, if they in any way impede their movement. So I think... Well, yeah, I think this is yeah. one of the great ironies. And I know this is something that you and I have, have both talked about in the past, about the way in which when you look around the world at some of the, um, you know, the major economic powers uh, at, a, at, a, at a national level at the moment, that those countries have got to that situation um, by being able to do precisely the sorts of things that you're talking about. They've been able to negotiate with um, uh, international economic interests in such a way that they can, for example, put local content requirements um, on their, their, their in, in investors or, or, or companies coming in. And now those are precisely the countries who have been trying to sort of prosecute an international order in such a way that removes the ability of other democratic um, entities uh, from doing exactly the same thing. So I think there's a kind of a great, there's a great sort of, you know, historical irony in the way that, that you know, what, what was held up as um, good for um, a few at one time uh, in order to be successful economically has subsequently been denied others, i.e. any kind of democratic control over the economic activity which, which happens at the, at the local place-based, um, on a, a place-based area. So yes, I think that's a, it's, a, it's a, one of the main issues. And would you also argue that we absolutely need to turn things on their head and bring back protectionism? You know, the idea that this is a dirty word and some kind of narrow nationalistic, um, uh, you know, right-wing idea where we're protecting ourselves from other countries. No, we're talking about the right for governments to protect their economies, their environments, and their citizens from the ravages of the out-of-control economic entities. Um, the um, Nobel Prize winning economist Paul Krugman um, once famously, famously uh, made the point that the, how the, uh, the, be the benefits of free trade had been sort of greatly overstated and, and also the downsides of um, protectionism had also been kind of greatly exaggerated. And I suppose my only issue is with, is, is, is with the language. I mean, we talk about protectionism. When we talk about protectionism, what we're actually talking about was um, what you were mentioning earlier. That is that there should be some democratic control over the economy. Yeah. Um, we should be able to say whether we think something is going to be beneficial to us. We should be able to, um, you know, democratic intervene and shape the kind of economy that we want. And of course, that is the the, the absence of that is the absence of having the ability to protect people. But you could also say, you know, it's as much about advancing um, a, a different idea of an economy rather than protecting you from all the negatives. But effectively, it comes to much the same thing, that there should be more democratic opportunities, ability to exert control over the shape of the economy. So, yes. That's brilliant. Thanks so much, Andrew.